Hey everybody, welcome to the very last lesson in this Bible study series that we've been calling God Our Deliverer. This has been a study of the first eight chapters of Judges and today we're going to jump ahead in history to, uh, the, first, uh, to the third chapter of 1 Samuel, but it's all a part of the same lesson, God Our Deliverer and how God raises up people of influence uh, among us. Uh, before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray, shall we? Father, uh, it's hard for us to imagine a time when we were more in desperate need of uh, people of godly influence to lead us. Uh, our culture is in such desperate need of truth, um, of your word, uh, of uh, the truth about ourselves, the truth about you, the truth about the world we live in. And so our prayer, Father, is that, uh, that you'll help us uh, understand your ways in that regard. You'll help us change and become the people that you've called us to become. Uh, you'll help us to trust and obey uh, at all at completely new levels than we are accustomed to. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will have your way in our lives and in this world. Um, as we open your word today, will you open our hearts? Will you change us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's going to be a little bit of a review. We're going to look back on some very overarching uh, truths from the first eight chapters of Judges that we've learned, but we're also uh, having identified the problem that the book of Judges identifies for the human condition. We're also going to jump ahead and look at chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, which provides a solution to that problem, if you will. It provides a, a, a transition from the period of the judges to the period of the king. Samuel was that person. And so we will see to, in today's lesson uh, God's answer for the, the very problem that the, the book of Judges identifies for us. Uh, we will be uh, skipping uh, maybe what, what most would consider some of the very worst parts of Judges. Uh, by that I mean that this, this cycle of rebellion that we've seen in Judges just gets deeper and deeper and worse and worse and further and further away from God. And so the, the horror uh, and the, 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 the dirt and the grit and the, 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 the evil of it all gets worse and worse as you move through the book of Judges. We're going to be skipping uh, really what is one of the most sordid eras in, Israel, in Israel's history as you get later into the book of Judges. Uh, but we did at least, we, we got enough of judges to see this trajectory, to see this, this spiral downward in the people of Israel. And we've learned uh, to find ourselves in that spiral. spiral. We've learned something about the human condition, um, that, there, that there is this tendency on our part to do what is right in our own heart as opposed to trusting and obeying God and God's word. Uh, we looked, at, looked for and found ourselves in this story. Um, in the midst of the broken world that we all live in. And so I th I, we're going to go back and we're going to pick up a couple of those points again just as a reminder of what's broken, and then we will look ahead to Samuel to see what God's plan is for fixing that brokenness. Samuel's story really does provide that answer, both for Israel but also for us. Uh, he, he, he provides uh, the, the, the answer for this continued cycle of rebellion on the part of the human condition. Before we see that answer, though, let's do look back and specifically identify the problem. Let's recall uh, some of the stories that we've looked at before just to specifically identify here's what the problem is. Um, uh, we, we, now is a good time to remind ourselves what God's plan from the very beginning was. From the time God created the world, knowing that there would be this fall, this sin, and knowing that the world would become broken and just become more and more broken over time. God, from the very beginning, had a plan, and His plan was, number one, to send a Savior. That would, that would be the spiritual, uh, to, to fix the spiritual brokenness. But secondly, He would call out a people. And he did that through Abraham and, and through the Jewish people. He would call out and set apart a people, and he would help those people know how to live their lives in a way that pointed the world to him. They would be a spiritual influence in this world. That was his plan from the beginning. And so when he brought the people of Israel into the Promised Land and said, this is where you're going to do it, this is your land, the idea there was set yourselves apart, live separately from the rest of the world, 
live in accordance with the laws and the rules that I give you and demonstrate to the world the way I created mankind to live. Um, that was the purpose. That was the whole reason that they were in the promised land from the beginning. Um, I, 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 I think it's important to note here that it was never God's plan, so to speak, to create a religion. That was never the plan. The plan wasn't to create a religion. Rather, the plan was to create or to, to have a people that were set apart who knew God and would help the world come to know God as well. That was the plan. Um, obviously, it didn't play out quite that way, but that was the plan from the beginning. And so to set themselves apart and not be influenced by the world, but rather to influence the world was the plan. Uh, let me just remind you then um, uh, from Judges chapter 3. This was one of the first few lessons that we did looking at Judges chapter 3. And starting in verse 5, this is, this is the way the plan ended up playing out. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. So what we see, the way the plan played out is God told them, here is your land, live here, get rid of everyone else that's in this land, separate yourselves from, this, from the world, and live according to my laws. And they did just the opposite. They took the land, but they ended up being influenced more by the culture than they were influencing the culture. And this is the problem that comes about when, when everyone is just doing what is right in his own heart or in his own mind. And that's uh, the theme of the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king, and every man did what was right in his own heart. Everyone was just using, relying on their own sense of right, their own sense of justice in order to figure their way forward. And by doing that, when we do that, when we choose to live by our own sense of what is right and wrong, our own sense of justice, uh, rather than trusting and obeying the Word of God, then what ends up happening is we end up being influenced more by the world and looking more like the world than we are an influence to the world. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank. This is, this is just identifying the problem that the book of Judges shows us about ourselves. The first blank on your listening guide, God's plan for His people was never to create a religion. It was for His people to demonstrate to a lost and broken world the abundant life in community with one another and in communion with God. Let me say that again. It was for His people to demonstrate to a lost and broken world the abundant life in community with one another and in communion with God to show the world the lives for which we were created. That was the plan from the beginning. God wanted that from His people Israel. He wants that from Christ's followers today. That's the plan. And yet, when we live our lives looking more like the world than we do like God, we are not fulfilling that plan. We are not getting this right. Um, and, and Deborah, uh, when we, when we, if you recall the, the lesson on Deborah, Deborah began to serve that purpose of pointing the people to God, at least in the sense that she served as a judge, and she's really, I mean, that she served as a prophetess. Uh, she's really the only judge until Samuel comes along, which some people would refer to as the last of the judges. Deborah was the only one who also had the role of prophetess. From uh, Judges chapter 4, now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. This is starting in verse 4 of chapter 4. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. So uh, not only was she acting as a judge, but she was also a prophetess, and because of that she was hearing from the Lord. She was hearing a word from the Lord. She was discerning truth, and she was hearing from God, which at that time was an enormously valuable asset, a valuable commodity, so to speak. And by the way, it's a valuable commodity in our culture as well. Being able to hear from the, the Lord, hear from God, finding truth in the midst of chaos, in the midst of a broken world, that is a, a huge, huge thing. And Deborah brought that. But even Deborah, even though she was hearing from God, when it was all said and done, and we look back and see what Deborah accomplished, what she did not accomplish, even Deborah, 
What she did not accomplish was actually connecting the people to God. The people were very much connected to her as a judge, but the people were not, when it was all said and done, were not actually connected to God. So when Deborah was gone, the cycle just picked up and continued right where it left off. And such was the case with every single judge all the way up to Samuel. The judge, the, the judge would, would rightly judge the people, deliver the people. They would, they would live a, a peaceful life. As long as that judge was alive, they were, they were connected to the judge. But as soon as the judge was gone, they lost that connection. They were never connected to God, and the cycle would just continue all over again. None of the judges, as it turns out, none of the judges all the way up to Samuel successfully connected the people to God. Rather, the people ended up being connected to the judge. Uh, And so we saw this happen again with Gideon. Uh, uh, the story of Gideon where he, he had some great success because he was very much connected to God and trusting God and obeying God, but how he handled that success changed everything. He did not stay connected to God. He did not handle that success in a way that caused him to continue to lean into God and to trust and obey God. Rather, what he did with that success was he began to lean into his own strengths, his own charisma, his own abilities, Uh, And because of that, because he was trusting in his own sensibilities and his own feelings, just like everyone else was, he began to pull further and further away from God. So we saw this pattern continue with judge after judge after judge. We saw in Gideon what happens when a spiritual leader allows the story to become about him or her rather than about God. And that was such a critical takeaway from the story of Gideon. Judges chapter 8, you remember this from verse 27, Judges chapter 8. And Gideon made an ephod and put it in his city in Ophrah, and all of Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house, that's Gideon. And now Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives, And his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. This is a reminder of Gideon's story. Gideon's story is a story of a judge who initially was all about uh, trusting and obeying God, but eventually made the story all about him rather than about God, and again, failed to connect the people to God. His popularity outgrew his character, if you will his spiritual connection to God. He failed to connect the people to God. He failed to have in place a mechanism to check his own heart, to help warn him when he begins to make the story about him rather than about God. He failed to have any kind of a mechanism in place to help him examine his own heart and his own motives. And how we talked about how critical that is for a leader of God's people today to have in place, to be able to check himself or check herself check his heart, check her heart uh, with regard to why am I doing this? Am I making the story about me or am I making the story about God? And, and the book of Judges, frankly, shows us what happens when God's own people do not live lives in repentance and in communion with him. It shows us what kind of a people we become when we are not in this regular routine of repentance and examining our heart before the Lord, but rather we're getting all caught up in what we've accomplished and what we've achieved, and the story begins to be about us. Uh, The same is true for us today as Christ followers. Our, Our goal as Christ followers should be to be abiding in Christ, not abiding in the ways of the world, but sometimes we get lost in the ways of the world. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement on your listening guide. Abiding in Christ was never intended to be some lofty platitude that we aim for but never hit. Rather, it is a way of being. Those are your blanks. Abiding in Christ is a way of being for Christ followers every minute of every day. We can abide in Christ or in the ways of this world but we cannot do both. In any given minute, in any given day, in any given season in our lives, we are either abiding in Christ or we are abiding in the ways of the world, but we cannot do both. We have to choose. 
And so it's a choice that we must make regularly throughout our day. And, and so that's what was not happening in the book of Judges. The, the, the judges themselves were not really helping the people learn to, to live in communion with God and in community with one another but certainly in communion with God. They weren't helping them learn to do that and to stay connected to God, to abide in the ways of God. Rather, they were just beginning to abide in the ways of the world around them, which is exactly the temptation that we face today. So that's the problem. That's the problem. God's people and judges just stopped connecting to God. So if that's the problem, the story of Samuel presents us with the answer, the solution. Because Samuel was going to do something as the last judge of Israel. Samuel was going to do something that none of the other previous judges had succeeded in doing. And that is beginning to connect the people back to God in a way that would make a difference. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, I hope you've got them open to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We're just going to look at at this uh, very familiar story in 1 Samuel chapter 3 of God's initial calling to Samuel when he was just a little boy. Um, and uh, you can have your Bible app open if you don't have a Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Uh, and, uh, and we're going to be looking at what it has to say to us. God's answer and the correction to the problem comes through Samuel. First, a little bit of background on Samuel. He was born to, um, to a woman who thought she was barren. She was an older woman. Her name was Hannah. She and her husband had no children. She was convinced that she just wasn't going to be able to have children. She began to cry out to the Lord, wondering, why have you done this? Asking him, she would weep. She was, uh, had made the, the journey. She was a godly woman. She was one of maybe, maybe few people in Israel who were actually still um, following the Torah and, and making the journey. Uh, to, at that point, Shiloh, which was where the tabernacle was, and praying every year at the tabernacle in Shiloh. And, and when she was there, uh, Eli, the priest, saw her weeping, and there was an interaction between them, and Eli blessed her and promised her that God would answer her prayer, and that's exactly what happened. Then the next year she came back to Shiloh, she had a son. His name was Samuel. And because of that, because God had answered that prayer, she committed to the Lord, she made a promise to the Lord that Samuel would be raised um, in commitment to God. And so when Samuel was uh, very young, right after he was weaned from her, which would have been whatever, two, three years old, four years old, right after he was weaned, she dedicated him to a life of service in the tabernacle and she, she literally gave him to Eli for Eli to raise. So. Um, and, and then every year she and her husband would come back and get to visit Samuel when they would make their trip to Shiloh where the ta- tabernacle was. But Eli was the one responsible for raising this young man. Well, we also learn in just the first couple of chapters of Samuel that Eli was a horribly flawed priest. There were lots of problems. His sons were, were not fulfilling the law of God. They were not good priests at all. Uh, they, were, they were just basically feeding their own appetites and, and getting fat, so to speak, off of, uh, off of their lives as priests. And, and Samuel did very, I mean, Eli did very little uh, as a father. He failed completely as a father in their lives. And, and so as flawed as he was, he was the priest who was responsible for raising Samuel. Uh, Samuel was probably, at the time we pick up in chapter 3, what we know is he didn't come there until he had been weaned, and then there were several years uh, that his mother and father would come and visit him annually after that. So we probably are finding Samuel when he is somewhere between 8 or 9 years old and maybe 12 or 13 years old. Somewhere in there is where we find him when we pick up with chapter 3. He is... um, is serving the Lord in the tabernacle. In fact, he sleeps in the tabernacle. That's his home. That's where he lives. And that's where we pick up in chapter 3 with verse 1. Here's how it sounds. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Now that is just hearkening back to the problem right, to the problem that the the whole book of Judges gives us. This is picking up right at the tail end of that time period of Judges. Uh, The word of the Lord was rare, and there was no frequent vision. There were no prophets at the time. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place, which would have been 
within earshot of the tabernacle, but not in the tabernacle. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Uh, stop there and recognize the lamp of God was to burn according to Leviticus and Exodus continuously, but what that really means is throughout the night. It didn't burn during the daytime, but throughout the night. And so uh, the priest, or in this case, maybe Samuel was the one doing this, the, uh, would put enough oil in the lamp to make it burn through the night, and then it would burn out sometime in the wee hours of the morning, just as dusk would begin to, to come, I mean, just at the, at the, as sunrise would happen. And so the lamp was still burning, and that means that when this event happens, it was in the wee hours of the early, early morning. And then the Lord called Samuel and said, and he said, Samuel said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. So Samuel thought this was Eli calling him. But he said, I did not call. But uh, Eli said, I did not call. Go lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call my son. Go lie down again. So Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, we know, because we know the, the, uh, this about the Bible, that Samuel eventually becomes an actual prophet who hears from the Lord all the time. But he, that has not started happening yet. And so he did not recognize this still, small voice of God calling him. That was not a familiar voice to him. He just assumed it must have been Eli calling him. That's the problem. He doesn't recognize yet the voice of the Lord. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And and isn't that the problem that the book of Judges highlights for us? Uh, again, uh, God's people were failing spectacularly in their assignment, which was to live in communion with God and in community with one another so that the world could see how God created us to live. They were failing spectacularly in that. That's the problem. They were not hearing from God. So God's word was rare, and any genuine understanding of who God is uh, was equally rare. There was no vision. There were no prophets. There was no one helping them do this. The priests were not helping them do this. Eli wasn't even helping his own sons do this and understand who God is. So God's answer to that problem in this case was going to be to raise up more than just a judge, not just another military leader to deliver them. Now God was going to raise up a judge and a prophet who would help the people hear from God, who would reconnect the people to God. And a few verses, a few verses further down in chapter 3, this is what we read. This is not in our lesson, but in, uh, starting in verse 19 of chapter 3, look at what it says. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Stop and let that sink in for just a second. What an amazing word. The Lord grew him and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, every word that Samuel would end up speaking from that point for the rest of his life would have eternal significance, would be significant, would be truth. Every single word, none of it was a wasted word. None of it was a word that just meant nothing or that or had no impact. All of his words would. That's an enormous an enormous thing in his life. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. That gives us God's evidence of an answer, of a solution to the problem that the book of Judges demonstrates for us. God's plan at that time was, and at this time is, the same. For God's people to commune with God, to abide in God, to abide in Christ, and to, commune, to live in community with each other in a way that actually impacts the world around them. That's, that's our job. That is our role, to commune with God and to live with one another in a way that actually has an impact on the world around us. And the solution to that was through Samuel to help the people of Israel begin to do that. And he, he still raises up people, even in our day. He still raises up people to speak His truth with love into this world, to help the world see what God is all about. He still raises people up to do that. 
And by the way, I think that in today's world, when we are so desperate for truth, when we are so desperate to understand truth, we don't know who we can trust for truth anymore. We can't trust anyone, it feels like. We are desperate for truth. We're desperate for God's truth, for God's word to help us see the truth about ourselves and about one another. I don't think we've ever been more desperate than we are in the brokenness of the world that we live in right now. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement on your listening guide. The highest and most desperate need in a lost and broken world is hearts transformed by the Word, and that's capitalized Word. That is through Jesus, who is the living Word, and through God's Word, the Bible. Hearts transformed by the Word. All of the world's secular, social, and political solutions those, those solutions, the world's secular, social, and political solutions have fallen short, and they always will. The world's solutions will never solve the spiritual problems that the world is facing. We need truth. We need truth. God would provide that through Samuel. God provides that through his written word and through uh, shepherds in, even in today's world. Let's keep reading, though, in verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. That's such an important concept here. Eli, whatever else he got wrong, he perceived rightly that this was God calling Samuel. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Verse 10, And the Lord came and stood, calling, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. All right. So we know this story well. This is, this is certainly in the top ten children's stories that we all have heard. We know this story well. Um, how frightening it must have been for this young boy, for Samuel, to be hearing this voice. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been uh, alone in the dark in a church, uh, but it's, it, it can be a little bit of a frightening experience. He is in the tabernacle where God resides just behind that veil, just behind that curtain. The God of the universe, supposedly, according to them, would reside there. And Samuel wouldn't have known much about that, but that would have been a, a pretty creepy place, I think, to be sleeping every night all by yourself. And this little boy is there, and he's hearing a voice, and it turns out it's not the only person he thought it could be. It turns out it's not him. And so certainly this must have been a frightening experience for him. But how grateful are we for Eli? Again, as flawed as he is, as many things as he got wrong, he got one thing very right. He recognized this must be God calling him. And so he helped Samuel know what to do. He helped Samuel know how to hear from God and how to respond to God. And that is such an important concept of this whole story. We need people in our lives who will do that. This is a critical role for spiritual shepherds to play in our lives, not to tell us what to do, but rather to help us hear from God, to help us know this is the voice of God in your life. This is the way God speaks and to help us recognize that and know how to respond to that, help us to learn to hear from God. So, so God, not only, God not only raised up Samuel, but he used people around Samuel to make sure Samuel is moving in the right direction. He used Samuel's own parents to put him on the right path. He used Eli, a flawed, horribly flawed priest, to help put Samuel on the right path, to point him in the right direction. This role of community is critical in our lives. It's critical in the lives of every spiritual giant you've ever heard of or ever been exposed to. The role of God's people in that person's life had a lot to do with shaping them and moving them in the direction they needed to go, and it's still happening today as well. Fill in the last blank on your listening guide. For any Christ follower, the pathway to spiritual maturity and influence is necessarily through community with other Christ followers. God planned it so from the beginning. 
And so through the book of Judges, we see the problem is the people are not paying attention to God. They're not looking for God. They're not searching for God. They're not communing with God. They're not abiding in God the way they were taught in the Torah to do. They're not doing it. And so God raised up judge after judge after judge to deliver them temporarily from their problems. But those judges also failed to connect the people to God until Samuel. And in Samuel's life, we see God's solution to that problem. Samuel would actually begin to hear from God on a regular basis and successfully begin to connect the leadership of, of God's people back to God so that they can begin to experience God again in their lives. Observations then about this entire study of Judges are observations from this lesson that we've looked at as an overview. Number one, our role in God's plan is to demonstrate to a broken world communion with God and community with one another. That's why we are here, to demonstrate that to a watching world. Secondly, abiding in Christ, that is an everyday decision. That is an everyday moment-by-moment -moment decision that we must make rather than uh, abiding in the ways of the world or abiding in the world, but rather to abide in Christ, to learn to be in the world but not of the world is so important for us. Uh, next, the world uh, that we live in is desperate for truth, is desperate for the, the Word of God. Uh, that is the answer that we're all looking for. And then lastly, those whom God raises up to speak truth are necessarily going to be shaped and guided by community, just like Samuel was shaped and guided by community with God's people. And these are some important takeaways, not only from this lesson, but from the entire study of the book of, of Judges, which I have just really loved doing. I've really loved doing this, and so I hope you have as well. Starting next week, we're going to start a whole new unit. We're going to be in the book of James. It's, going to, it's, going to, it's a unit that's called Authentic Faith and what that looks like uh, even in our current culture. I can't wait to get into that study with you. In the meantime, I love you guys. I hope you have a blessed week, and we will see you right here next week to start that new study.